God is a God who thinks and acts and speaks, and he speaks in ways that are intelligible. And communication is vital to human flourishing. You know, if you can't communicate well with your spouse, with your child, uh, even with your pet, you can't get the point across to people, then, or animals in some cases, then you're just in the dark. But so what are the other religions and what are some of the sentences that you use to describe them as headlines? <clears throat> well, I start out with Judaism and the statement that I took was God's revelation to Moses in the burning bush where Moses said, what is your name? Who is sending me to deliver your people? And God says, I am who I am. I was talking to a rabbi about this uh, a few months ago and uh, I, he was curious. The book had not come out yet. And he said, what, what sentence did you use for Judaism? And he thought I was going to use the Shema, you know, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. And I said, well, I certainly could have chosen that. But I wanted to deal with the Jewish concept of God. Um, and I also relate that in the book to Jesus' statement, uh, before Abraham was, I am. I think it's legitimate to use that uh, statement from Judaism, from Exodus 3, because Judaism, of course, is nothing without the God who makes the covenant with the Jews and the God who delivers the Jews from Egypt and who makes promises about their coming redemption, which we as Christians believe has come through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So what I look at is the significance of this statement. It's kind of a mysterious statement. It can be translated a few different ways. But there's some key elements that I like to focus on as a philosopher. And one is that God is a self-reflective personal being. He says, I am who I am. So he's not an impersonal force or principle or some unknowable, unnameable something, which actually comes up in Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism. He is a reflective agent who makes promises and fulfills those promises. He's a person. And then I also he's focus not an energy on the force. fact. Yeah, it's not a universal energy force principle consciousness something like that. I mean, he is a consciousness. He's a self-reflective being who acts in the world. And also something I point out, which is so significant, and this has to do with the philosophy of language, is that God is a God who speaks. He speaks truth into the world. And uh, the great Carl Henry, with whom I'm sure you're familiar, had a lot in his uh, sixth volume, God, Revelation, and Authority, on the God who speaks, the God who speaks and shows. And compare that to Taoism, for example, in the Tao Te Ching, it says the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. Well, that should have been the end of the book right there, because <laughs> the Tao cannot be spoken, the Tao cannot be written, the Tao cannot be cogitated. The Tao just is a big question mark. But that's not biblical religion. God is a God who thinks and acts and speaks, and he speaks in ways that are intelligible. And communication is vital to human flourishing. You know, if you can't communicate well with your spouse, with your child, uh, even with your pet, if you can't get the point across to people, then or animals in some cases, then you're just in the dark. That's and this so is. I focus uh, on. We're gonna we're gonna hit pause there. We'll be right back. You were just talking about the Eastern religions, and they really have. I always find it funny and, and kind of overly gracious when people say they talk about the great religions of the world or whatever. It really, we're talking about dramatically different things. I mean, when you're talking about Judaism and Christianity or even Islam, th they might be spoken of together. But when you start talking about the Eastern religions, it's really more like philosophy. It's more like, it, it, it just, it's dramatically different. Uh, so when people say, you know, d don't all religions effectively say the same thing? Not even, not even close. And that's why I'm glad you wrote the book, World Religions in Seven Sentences. So let's talk about some of those Eastern religions. Right. Well, one we could uh, talk about, which I mentioned in the previous segment, is Taoism. And Taoism doesn't have huge numbers of followers around the world, maybe just a few million. But there is this book, which is one of the most uh, translated and popular books of all time, actually. It's way behind the Bible, but it's called the Tao Te Ching, or uh, The Way. And it was supposedly written by a sage 
named Lao Tzu. Not, not much is known about Lao Tzu. He may not have even existed. We're not sure about that. But it actually doesn't matter to Taoism. Of course, it matters tremendously to Christianity that Jesus existed and died to atone for our sins and rose from the dead. But Taoism uh, has this statement in the Tao Te Ching that many people know and man, many people take to be extremely profound. And that is the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. So what does Tao mean? Tao roughly means the way or the path. And uh, Taoism, if you read the Tao Te Ching and compare it to the Bible, it's extremely different. It's a collection of aphorisms, sayings. Uh, there's really no narrative to speak of. There's nothing like uh, prophecy, fulfilled prophecy, very different than the Bible. But as a, as a philosopher and just as a thinker, I wanted to look at this idea that the Tao or the way of life, the basic reality of being cannot be spoken. So if it is spoken, if it is written, then it's not the eternal Tao. Now, in one sentence, in one way, that's just obvious because a sentence about something is not the same as the thing you're describing. So a sentence about Eric is not the same as Eric, but that's just trivial. They're trying to say something more than that. And that is that uh, the deepest dimensions of being cannot be put into language whatsoever. So how can you know that? How can you even write the sentence, the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao? That's a sentence about the Tao denying knowledge about the Tao. So we're getting into a, a logical problem there. But just think about this idea. If this sentence is supposedly indicative of reality, that means that if you want to know the way of life, the way of having a family, the way of pursuing a career, the way of enjoying nature, the way of religion, well, you really have no word on that. I mean, compare that to scripture, like to John 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. All things are made through him. And without him, nothing has been made that has been made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word there, of course, is logos, which is a very profound word philosophically because it has to do with the ordering of the universe. Now you might say, well, that sounds like Tao. Could you say in the beginning was the Tao? No, because the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. And uh, Jesus Christ is the Logos incarnate. In fact, in John 1.18, it says that the Logos has made the Father known, made the Father known. He was the living word, and he taught the truth about God and the way to live and salvation and the afterlife. So two things could really not be more different than the Logos and the Tao, because the Tao is supposedly beyond words, beyond description, beyond language. And there's a whole school of thought uh, that teaches this kind of thing. You see, you see it in parts of Hinduism, too. The idea that Brahman, the ultimate reality, is beyond language, beyond thought. Brahman has no qualities, no attributes. You can't say anything about something that has no qualities. In fact, if something has no qualities, it can't even exist. That's a basic logical problem. <laughs> so a lot of what I, what I do in the book is to uh, try to compare a, a Judeo-Christian worldview and concept of revelation and a more Eastern view of uh, one form of Buddhism and Taoism and I also uh, critique Buddhism along those lines, too. Welcome back. I'm talking to Dr. Douglas Grotheis, professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary. The new book is World Religions in Seven Sentences. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the things missing uh, from some of the Eastern religions that you've touched on uh, are the ideas of, of uh, joy uh, and love. Um, there, there seems to be a bleakness or a blankness at the heart of some of these philosophies. In other words, they seem to be uh, anti-human, as though the goal of life is mm -hmm. to transcend life, um, which 
uh, not only is it un unappealing, but it, it seems um, very, very confusing. Uh, and I think, you know, when you were talking about Nietzsche's view of Christianity, sometimes Christianity has been twisted in those directions so that people, w whether Nietzsche or Mark Twain or other people, th they have been responding to a bastardized version of Christian faith, a, a, a version of Christian faith that is that is kind of bleeding toward Gnostic view or or, or those kinds of things, and so so the the biblical faith is not that kind of a faith. It's a very human, grounded faith. Uh, God comes to redeem uh, matter. Uh, he doesn't tell us just to transcend matter, but that's exactly the opposite of of what you're describing in some of the Eastern religions. Well, it is, and you have to go back to the nature of God and the creation that God brought forth. So we're told in Genesis that God created one kind of thing after another, and he says, it is good, it is good. After he creates human beings, he says, it is very good. And we're told in Genesis that we're made in the image and likeness of God. And that is a teaching that's found in exactly one religious book, the Bible, is not found in any other religious book. In fact, recently, I'm not going to get political on this, but recently uh, Vivek Ramaswamy was asked about his beliefs. He said, well, I'm a Hindu, and as a Hindu, I believe everyone is made in the image of like and likeness of God. And I went, whoa. Yeah, wait a no, minute. What, what version of Hinduism is that? That's, <laughs> that's, right. that's called American the cultural version. Hinduism, which is actually yeah, not Hinduism. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, Hinduism teaches the exact opposite, which is the caste system, that human beings are born into specific castes, and they cannot change castes within their lifetime. It's based on karma and reincarnation, two other things the Bible, two things the Bible does not teach. And it was, it was fascinating. I just wrote a little article on that, which will probably come out in the stream fairly soon. But there's exactly one religious book, one sacred scripture that teaches were made in the image and likeness of God. And that's the Bible. You don't find it in Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. It's not in Islam either, because Islam teaches that Allah is so transcendent, so beyond us, that to say we're made in his image is actually considered blasphemy in Islam. But of course, being made in the image of God, according to the Bible, means that we reflect God, we represent God, we have certain qualities, we have creativity, we have relationality, rationality. But of course, we're infinitely short of being the uncreated creator. So there's still a distinction, a big gap between us and God. But according to personality, God is an infinite personality and we are finite personalities. And so the setup metaphysically is that God can speak to us. God can communicate to us. We can relate to God. Uh, the lines of communication, at least in terms of the basics of creation, are open the problem is sin. You know, the problem is rebellion against God. And that's exactly why the Christ came, is to atone for our sin. It's, it's funny when you bring up uh, Vivek Ramaswamy making that statement, that, oh, I'm a Hindu and I believe we're all made in, in, in God's image. And it, it just reminds me that when somebody claims to be some religion, chances are they're full of baloney. In other words, that, 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 that many times people say, I'm a Christian. Or, and you, you talk to them and you realize they don't have any idea of the most basic teachings. And I think that you find this a lot in the United States, that people identify as this or that, but they don't mm -hmm. even know the, the basics of it, really, so that they're actually only, he's a cultural Hindu, which is to say not a Hindu, but there are many people that are cultural Catholics or, or, or cultural Christians or cultural uh, Muslims. I meet them every day in New York. They don't really, they just kind of identify tribally. You know, I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia yeah. or I grew up here, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a Muslim, um, which is interesting to, to me because um, we are, uh, that's why it's important uh, that people understand what these religions teach and don't believe the lie that they're all sort of the same. Yeah. Your book, of course, right. titled World Religions in Seven Sentences, because the differences uh, among them are very dramatic. I mean, it just, just, you know, in the little bit we're touching on right now, you start realizing that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Stephen Prothero wrote a terrific book about 10 or 12 years ago called Religious Literacy. 
And he said, Americans are very religious, more religion, religious, let's say, than people in Western Europe. But they typically don't know much of anything about religion, including their own, which he thought was a paradox. Uh, we're much more religious than secular Europe. But he said secular Europeans tend to know more about religion, even though they're not religious. Americans tend to be religious, but are pretty ignorant about the religion they identify with and other religions as well. So one of the things my book can do is give you the basics on the world religions. Now, it is written from a Christian viewpoint, but I try to be fair with the other religions and I do critique the other religions philosophically and I compare them to Christianity. But uh, we live in a religiously plural world, especially if you're in a cosmopolitan area like you are, I am in Denver. So you are going to meet Buddhists and Muslims and New Age people and the rest of it. So we need to understand some basic beliefs. And of course, if we're followers of Christ, we need to understand what we believe and why, which is just vital. And, uh, you know, I've stopped looking at the Barna polls because they're always so such bad news about how Christians don't even really know what Christianity is. Well, we certainly should. Well, when you talk about, uh, you know, the Hindu caste system, for example, people need to know that that is racism. That is, a, that is as racist as it gets. One group is better than another group that's better than another group. That group is inferior. Those groups, those people are untouchable by definition. That is right. as antithetical to what the Bible teaches as anything ever could be. It's fundamentally right. un-American. Um, but that's the actual teaching of Hinduism. Uh, right. Somebody needs to tell Vivek. So what have, what have we left out? Well, we left out quite a bit. Maybe we could touch on Islam briefly, yeah. because we uh, talked about Hinduism and Taoism and briefly mentioned Buddhism. But of course, uh, Islam is a monotheistic religion. And some people will say that we have the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that all trace their lineage back to Father Abraham and God revealing himself to Abraham. Now, what I argue in the book is there's a natural continuity between Judaism and Christianity. Uh, Christ fulfills the messianic prophecies and the hope of Israel. And I make a case for that. But when you come to Islam, you have a discontinuity. Now, Yes, Islam is monotheistic. It believes there's one God who sends prophets, who created the world, who will judge the world. And Islam in the Quran says some positive things about Jesus, that he was sinless, that he worked miracles, things that are not said about Muhammad. But I want to emphasize in the book that there is no continuity between Christianity and Islam. Islam claims to be the replacement of Christianity and the replacement of Judaism because it is claiming a new revelation. Muhammad supposedly received a revelation from the God, Allah, through the angel Gabriel. But what do we find in that purported revelation? Well, the denial of the deity of Jesus, the denial that he died on the cross, which you don't have to be a Christian to believe any uh, secular historian of that period who emphasizes that period will certainly claim whatever else you think about Jesus, he was crucified by the Romans. That's a settled fact of history. Uh, denies, of course, that Jesus is divine, that he is the mediator between God and man. So I think it makes sense to ask the question, why should we believe this when we have such strong evidence for the Jesus of the New Testament? We have the gospel writers, the testimony of Peter and Paul. We have extra biblical historians attesting to certain facts about Jesus. And, and why is it that over 500 years later, uh, someone goes into a cave to meditate and supposedly receives a revelation that denies the gospel message of scripture, that Christ came to deliver us from our sins. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He's at the right hand of the Father. Uh, why should we believe this? I just don't find good reason to do so. So, Sure, you're describing monotheism. Islam is a monotheistic religion, along with Christianity and Judaism. But its type of monotheism is really quite different from what you have in either Judaism or in Christianity. So the sentence I chose for 
Islam is uh, there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet, which is what is confessed when someone becomes a Muslim. That's all they have to do is simply confess that with conviction. So I say, yes, there is one God, but Muhammad is not his prophet. 